There seems to be this sense of Christmas being an um, almost mythical place. It's like a time that's a long, 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 long ago in a galaxy far, far away, or like the, the land of Oz from the Wizard of Oz, or maybe more like a never, never land where you never have to grow up. Right? So we, we get to Christmas every year, and we, we go to this wonderful place which is warm and rosy and decorated and bright. And, uh, and then after a few days, you have to come back to, to reality when uh, you have to go back to work. Unless you, go, unless you live in Frankenmuth, Michigan. Has anyone here, have you heard of Frankenmuth? Frankenmuth, Michigan is a town in Michigan where it's Christmas all year round. It's kind of their shtick. They, uh, that's what you go there, you go Christmas shopping in the middle of July. Uh, so unless you live in Frankenmuth, eventually you have to come back from, from Christmas land. And, and the way that we tell the stories of Christmas tend to reinforce this sense that Christmas is this rosy, wonderful, perfect land. Uh, an example of this is uh, the way we tell the story of the wise men. And the way we usually tell the story of the wise men is pretty short and sweet, and it goes that there's these three uh, astrologers, wise men, they come out of the mists from the east and they show up and they kneel at uh, the bedside, or at the, at, at where Jesus is born in front of baby Jesus and they offer some gifts and then they fade back into the mists and isn't that wonderful, right? There's this, it's wonderful and, and it's amazing and it's mysterious. Let's actually read the story and, and pay attention to what's happening, because I, I think there's, there's a lot going on here. It's a fascinating story. Uh, Matthew 2, we start reading in Matthew 2. We read uh, of the Magi, uh, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. How many Magi were there? We know there were three gifts. There could have been seven Magi, and four of them were bumming it. There could have been six magi and they all doubled up. Ah, we, we really don't know. But there were some number of magi. There could have been two and they were very generous. Uh, so there were uh, some number of, of magi. And they had been studying stars in the sky. This time, astrology and astronomy were the same thing. And so they've been studying the stars and studying prophecy and studying prophecy of other nations. And so they see there's a new star in the sky. And so when the star uh, is in the sky, they, they start to follow that, that star. So they're looking for this newborn child who's been predicted in, in uh, Jewish prophecy. And, and so when do they show up? Right? Do, they, do they show up when Jesus is in the manger? No, they, they show up quite a while longer because they have to travel after the star is, is first uh, shows up in the sky. And, and they, they show up with these amazing gifts. The value of these gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the, the finest uh, commodities of the day, combined with uh, their education tells us something about them. You only educate people who uh, were nobility, and we're about to rule, right? And so 95, 98% of the people at the time were uh, farmers. They could grow enough uh, food to live on. And, and so really the only people left, the people who were educated were the nobility and the royalty. And so the fact that they were educated, they could gather up gold, but take two years off. This is like a, maybe like a third or fourth son of a royal family is probably what these are. Um, and so they're, they're traveling, and they go by camel or by horse, and they have to bring guards and translators. And they're going to be gone for like two years. Can you imagine what it cost to hire a retinue of guards and translators for two years? Like, this is an amazingly amount of, a, amazing amount of money they're throwing around. And, and why do they need translators and guards? Well, they're coming from the east, and it's, it reminds us that this is during the time of King Herod. And in King Herod, which is the time of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire controlled Spain, Italy, Egypt, and Israel is kind of what connected all of them around the Mediterranean. The only people, the only like major empires that had threatened the Roman Empire to this point were the Sassanids off to the east. And these are three nobility coming from the east. And so when some number of nobility come out of the east and they come into your territory and they're coming from the direction from which you have been invaded before and they don't talk the language, yes, they're going to need some guards and some translators. They're going to need a whole caravan to make this happen because this is rather dangerous. And they show up and they head to Jerusalem because if you're looking for a newborn king, where do you look first? You look in the nursery of the current king. And so they show up, they look, go to King Herod and say, hey, you got a kid? 
We hear he's a newborn king. And Herod does not have a newborn uh, child here. And, and so this is where things get, uh, starts getting interesting. They show up, they say, where is the child who has been born king of the, Jew, of the Jews? For we observed his star and we have come to pay him homage. Now, homage is a fun word, because homage literally means to kiss towards. And, and it's not like, if you kiss someone, you tend to be standing equal with them. To kiss towards someone is to bow down and to kiss their ring. Or, or to bow down and to kiss their feet. Or to kiss the, the ground that they walk on. If you pay homage, have you ever paid homage to someone? Like, that, that's a pretty high level of uh, commitment to someone. So they've shown up to pay homage, to commit themselves to the power and authority to the, the, king, uh, the kingdom of this new king. It is a rather big deal, and, and we read that when King Herod heard of this, he was frightened. And why is Herod frightened? Well, of course he'd be frightened. He, was, he is the current king of the Jews, and he doesn't have the newborn child, and so there's a kid out there somewhere who is going to be the next king, the next king in the line of David. And if you remember David, David is the one who about 600 years before had gathered all the tribes together to throw the people out of the land so that David would rule. And it started a whole Davidic dynasty and kingdom. And so Herod, who's ruling by the authority and power of the Romans, i.e. the invading people, when he hears that there's another king like David who's been born, that threatens his job security. That threatens whether he's going to be alive. That threatens whether his kids are going to be able to be king. This is quite the threat. Herod had been placed over Israel by the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire was not going to look kindly upon it if he lost control due to some upstart Jewish whippersnapper who happened to have the right last name, as they would see it. And so his legitimacy is rather tenuous, and the rest of Jeru Jerusalem is scared with Herod. Why is the rest of Jerusalem scared? Well, if you jump forward, remember what happens when he can't find the kid? He slaughters all the children under the age of two in that town. And so I'd be scared of someone who'd slaughter a whole generation of children too, to make a point. So Herod is scared. All of Jerusalem is scared. Things are rather tense. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, Herod asked them where Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, David's hometown, does it get any worse, right, for Herod? Therefore they replied, this is what the prophet has written, You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Like, it just keeps on getting worse for Herod. Like, this is a, a Davidic king from David's hometown, and so he says to them, See, then Herod secretly calls for the wise men and learns from them the exact time when the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently, and bring, them wor bring me word of where they are, so I might pay them homage. And by homage, he means may so I can assassinate them. That's, uh, that's what he's trying to get at. And he calls them together for a secret meeting. Why is it a secret meeting? It's damage control. Right? Because if, if he lets everyone else know where the kid's born, then they can go and pay him homage, and they can start a political... He's trying to nip in a bud a political movement. He doesn't want anyone to show up and worship this child. He needs to keep this really uh, out of the public eye. And so the, the Magi, this is the moment where the Magi have their sort of uh, reckoning, because they're told this kid is born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a town of 300 to 1,000 folk. We can't pin it down exactly, but archaeologically, that's what we can tell. There are 300 to 1,000 people in Bethlehem at this time period. And um, they could have bowed out at this point. They could have said, well, Herod, obviously you're the king in power. So here, have some nice gifts. And they could have gone back east. This is the point at which they, it shows what they're concerned about. They, had to go, they go ahead and go find this child, even though it becomes very clear that Herod is the one in power and that they're going to go to a, a kind of podunk small town, and, and that's where they're going to find this child. They're not, they're not getting what they expected. But uh, they go ahead. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. What would be the equivalent of such a caravan showing up in Shalbina? 
right? What would be like a foreign power who you were afraid of politically or militarily showing up to see someone who's new to town? Would it be like someone opening a new gas station and then like two years later, the, uh, all of the officials of the Chinese Communist Party coming in in white limos and, and pulling up in front? Like, how, how weird would that be? <laughs> it would get your attention. I can't think of another an analog, or maybe like in the mid-80s, like all of the Kremlin, the, the authorities in the Russian Kremlin, like, like showing up to talk to the guy who pumps your gas. Ooh, what's going on here? This is really weird. And so they show up, and you got to feel sorry for Mary. Like, Mary's just there chasing two-year-old Jesus. <laughs> A two-year-old boy is otherwise known as someone with a dash, death wish. I mean, they're fast, and they tear things apart. That's just how I was that way when I was two. That, that's how, so she's chasing G, little Jesus, trying to keep him from killing himself, and all of a sudden, they show up, right? And so they show up, and I'm not sure she has much to say, and they start offering the finest things. Like, it is entirely reasonable to expect that she wouldn't have known what frankincense or myrrh was. This is so expensive, so high-end, uh, such amazing materials. And so they are offered this gifts, offered these gifts, and, and then the Magi leave. And uh, now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And uh, this was, Jesus got up, took the child and his mother and went to Egypt. Why Egypt? Why did they go to Egypt? About 400 years prior to this, the Babylonian exile had begun. And so at the front end of the Babylonian exile, some Jews had escaped west to Egypt when Israel had fallen to the Babylonian invasion. And then after the 70 years of the Babylonian, Babylonian invasion, when some of the Jews came back from Babylon, some of them looked around at Israel and said, wow, this is going to be really hard work to rebuild a nation. Let's just keep on going west. And they just kept on going until they got to Egypt. And so at this point, there is a, a community of Jewish people in Egypt that was about three to 400 years old. And if there's one place you wanted to go as a Jew to escape and, and get away, Egypt was it. So that's where they had. And uh, Matthew then quotes a, uh, so when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. So Herod is angry. And so he kills, rough guess, it's probably about 20 children. If you look at the way the population falls, if you have about, thir if you have about, have about 300, 400 people in a village, that was probably about 20 children uh, is the rough guess. That's how many kids he has killed because he is scared. Matthew then quotes this scripture. Uh, that was fulfilled. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah wailing in loud lamentation, weep, Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. So that's the end of Christmas, right? We've hit, hit our 12 days of Christmas. We end, wrap up with Christmas with Epiphany, with the showing up of the wise men, and that ends up with uh, weeping mothers and the Holy Family fleeing for their lives to Egypt. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Jesus is born into a broken world, and as we finish the story of Jesus' birth, Matthew's not glossing over that. And I think it makes it clear that Christmas is not some sort of never-never land where everything is perfect. It's not in a galaxy uh, long, long ago, far, far away. Uh, I think what we see here is how uh, this good news of Jesus and the reality of life are interwoven in this story of the Magi and Herod, we see the very different responses to the birth of Jesus. Some people are excited and look to new things, and some people are terrified of, of, of the potential for change. And, and I find this, to be, this story to be good news, though good news of kind of an odd type. Because let me ask, did anyone here have a perfect Christmas? <laughs> Doesn't happen, does it? Right? We, we hold up Christmas as sort of this like perfect moment where every, th every dish comes out perfect and every gift is perfectly appreciated and every family member gets along. And that's just not what happens, is it? <laughs> it doesn't. 
Christmas doesn't have to be perfect, and it never has been. If you look back to the first Christmas, like, I am certain that the next day after Mary and Joseph, after Jesus is born, Mary looks at Joseph and says, I thought you were making the hotel arrangements. Like, there, that's got to have been a kind of a hard discussion. It's your hometown. Why didn't we have a place to stay? There is always something that goes on with, with Christmas. And then two years later, we have King Herod showing up and, and, and Mary spending her, her child's second birthday running for Egypt while uh, something goes down in, in, in their hometown. Christmas doesn't have to be perfect, and it never has been. Christmas is not a place of perfection. What Christmas is is the place where Jesus shows up. The meal doesn't have to be perfect. The plans don't have to work, work out perfectly. Not every gift will fit. As long as we pay homage to Jesus, the newborn king, I think we've celebrated Christmas well. The good news of, Chris, of Jesus does not begin with human perfection. The good news of Christmas begins with our imperfection, our perfect world, and a perfect Lord coming to be in it. A, a Lord who loves us so perfectly that he is willing to enter our mess, even when our, our mess involves politics as messed up as it was in the first century. I think the good news is, if Jesus, if Jesus willingly enters the mess called first century Roman and Jewish politics and life, if that's what Jesus is willing to enter for, out of the love for us, I believe he continues to be willing to enter our world today. Christmas doesn't have to be perfect, we just have to welcome a perfect Lord. Amen.